Yes, uh, I would like to apologize for being short. <laughs> I forgot to wear my high heels. Yeah. <laughs> I think coming to church is always a fun time, amen? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, these three ladies who were talking about their sons and how they were boasting about how uh, wonderful their sons was. And one of the mother said to the other mother, he said, my son is the bishop of the denomination. And when he comes into the church, everybody bow and say, your worship. And the other mother said, well, my son is the cardinal in the Catholic church. When he comes in, everybody bows down and say, your lordship. And then they look at the other mother, and the other mother look at them and say, uh, yeah, why? And he says, what about your son? And he says, uh, well, my son is not in the ministry. My son is six foot four and weighs 400 pounds. When he walks through the door of the church, everybody say, oh my God. <laughs> uh, you know, oftentimes we make, uh, you know, people tend to make jokes about, uh, you know, such things. But it reminds you about that when they talk about big, they are talking about God is, who is awesome and big over all. Amen. And uh, today as you celebrate your anniversary, you remember that when you started, it is that awesome God that brought you together and it's that awesome God that will lead you on to the great things that He wants to do, not for our name, but for His glory and name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this moment, even as we gather in your name. We are thankful that it is you that has established the work. It is you that has assembled your people, Father, of, from different backgrounds and different giftings and strengths, so that together they become the team here, O oh Lord, in praise assembly, Father. So that out of this team, Lord, that you would, O oh Lord, sow into the lives of people around here, your truth, your gospel, that would draw them into your kingdom for such a time as this. And so, Father, O oh Lord, we thank you, Lord, that even as you bring, O oh Lord, the next season of growth to this church, Lord, you bring an increase in the team. You bring strength to the team. Oh Lord, you bring maturity to the team so that together they can further establish, oh Lord, not just the work here, but other outreaches for your glory, oh Lord, for your mighty name. And so, Father, as we gather here this day, we thank you, Lord, that it's not your word, oh Lord, not my word that's going to be said, but it is your word. And whatever is not of you, put it aside. For that which is of you, let it be established in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'll just point to the uh, uh, computer guy and just switch accordingly to the slide. Okay, one of the things I think is so important when we talk about church is that we need to keep moving forward. Amen. Let's say it together. Keep moving forward. Amen. Being a Christian, one of the things we need to know that there is a daily process of... Uh, you know, growing. God is doing a work in each one of our lives and we need to press on. It is an instantaneous, but yet it is a continuing work in each one of our lives to move forward. You know, when I was young, um, I played hockey. And, uh, you know, in those days in Ipoh, uh, generally all my hockey team were all my matcha. Right? I was only Chinese, <laughs> generally speaking. So every wedding, every, uh, you know, uh, funerals, engagement parties, everything. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, when you have machas, they don't teach you good Tamil. Yeah, so there are words that I cannot use here. Praise God is an English service. <laughs> okay. But those were the days, you know, when you would play and, and, and football, hockey and all that. And it was fun. Uh, but now I can't play anymore. People ask me whether I still play my football. Yes, I use my fingers on my handphone. That's all. I can't run any more that much. But if you knew me the last few years ago, I was weighing 93, 94 kilos. That was my weight. It's about this size. But I, I realized that you need to make a change in order to make progress and grow in the Lord. There are certain things I couldn't speak about. Like I couldn't speak about gluttony, right? If you're weighing 93 kilos. Yeah. I had to cut down all my rasam and cut down all my payasam. Yeah? All the nice things in order for me to progress. And if we want to progress in the physical, we also need to progress in the spiritual. 
We understand in order to be healthy in the physical, we need to make a change. And in order for us to be healthy in the spiritual, we need to make a change. And every change requires intentionality. Yes? And that's where we are right now. You were before. For example, a musicians, they started from knowing nothing and then they progress and they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and then our bassist plays a lot of runs. Right? And all the keyboards with the strings and the drums, everything, keeping into the timing. But we all grew from where we were to where we are right now. But that's not the end because we are growing further in the things of God. Amen? So today when we talk about growing, it is actually a choice. We all make a choice to grow or not to grow. And that is something that you say, Pastor, I already know. Why you want to tell me this type of thing? If you are a Christian for more than 20 years, everything your pastor wants to speak here, you already know. Right or not? If you don't know, then go back to foundation class. Or when is the next baptism? We need to baptize you again because you don't know. Or in my church, I always say, we want to drown you one more time. In case the first time you didn't get it right, we need to drown you longer. But we need to understand this. It is a choice to grow. And I'm talking about a story that all of you know. And it's about Lord. How many, how many of you know that? Lord, Abraham's nephew. Yep, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 11. It tells us that Terah took Abraham, his grandson Lot, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of the son of Abraham, and together they set up from Ur of Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. And so Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years today, and when he set up for Haran, he took his wife, he took his nephew, all the possessions they had accumulated, the people that had acquired in Haran, they set out into the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now, we all know this story very well. Yep, Lord followed his grandfather and his uncle all the way out, and they were stuck in this town, Haran, for a long time till the grandfather passed away, and now God told Abraham to come on, let's move on. And Abraham moved on, and Lord went along. And we know from this story that Lord was a man who prospered as his uncle prospered. Amen? Today, I, since it's your anniversary, I'm going to do a twist in my sermon. I'm going to do a reverse psychology sermon. Can or not? Yeah. Today, the sermon title is Three Ways to Mess Up Your Life. So if you follow everything I say, you will be a successful failure. Can? Pastor Abner says, no putumayam for you. No. <laughs> but three ways to mess up your life. That's the sermon. Yeah? So if you do not want to be a successful failure, do the opposite of what I'm saying. Let's look at this scripture. I'm not sure whether it's there. But Abraham left Egypt, traveled north to Nagif and his wife and Lord, and they brought everything they had. And Lord was very rich with flocks of sheep, goats, and cattle, and many tents. Let me jump down straight there. Okay, the land could not support Abraham and Lot, as you all know, and so their servants started to fight with each other because not enough land, not enough water for their cattle and their sheep and their herds. And so Abraham said, look, you know, let's not fight about it. Okay, take your choice of the land that you want. I'm jumping ahead and we will separate. Genesis 13, yeah, verse 6 onwards. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, I will go to the left. And Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of Jordan Valley in the direction of Zohar. The whole area was well watered everywhere like the Garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Yep. Lord chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flock, servants, and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan and Lord moved his tents to a place near Sodom, settled among the cities of the plain, but the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Okay, we all know this story. I'm not going to go repeat it too many times. It's many verses. We all know Abraham and Lord, they prospered very well. They had not enough land, not enough water to feed all their respective cattle and herd. And so Abraham, as the older man, say, Look, Lord, you make a choice. I give you a chance. Okay, in an Asian context, you never give the younger ones a chance in one sense which is uh, kind of bad now because as we grow the church for a future church, we need to give the young people a chance. Oh, the young people say, lah, hello, and then I get dinner. I say, but all the old people are staring at me. 
I'm also trying to let go to the younger ones a bit. Yeah, uh, but the thing is this. Lord make a choice. He look at the land, just like if Lord was Susu Bang Jaya, he look at Sunway and say, this one very good, you know. Got Sunway Mall. Got all the shops. How many chapati shop here? How many roti chane shop? How many restaurants here? How many colleges in Subang Jaya? This is a good place. How many of you know Subang Jaya is a good place? Yeah? My, my, daut- my daughter uh, says that the only thing Sunway doesn't have is a memorial hall. You can be born in the hospital, right? Then go to the international school from young until uh, your A-levels and then enter into college, finish, graduate, yeah? work in Sunway, and then one day, if you're not well, Sunway Hospital. And then, Stan Street stop there, no more else. Is it? So, Sunway City is missing one thing. And actually, Subang Jaya is missing that one thing, especially for churches, we don't have that. Yeah? But, but think about that, it's a good place. And Lord look at it and say, hey, I want to bring my family there. But the Bible tells us it is a bad place. And his choices is the one that brought him in the situation. He saw, if you look at the next slide, he saw, he considered, he lusted, and he went. That was where he ends. And a lot of times we make a choice. We made a choice to progress based on what we want. What we want. You know, I have someone that I know who wanted to go full-time. He said, the Lord spoke to me. I said, great. You know, I'm going to resign and now go to Bible school. Great. But after a while, I don't know what happened. I'm like thinking to myself, hey, when are you going to see me? I'm the pastor of the church. Yeah. Then he was telling me, you know, this Bible school is not so good, you know. Why am I must study this subject? Why must I not study this subject? Why the other Bible school better? But then if I go there, they also ask me to study this subject. Why must I study this subject? I don't need to study this subject. I say, I give you a word of the Lord. Why don't you just shut up and do it? <laughs> yeah. Because that's what your father will tell you if you sign up with Sunway College for a course. Don't care whether you like physics or ed maths or not. It is in a requirement. You just do it. <laughs> Sure enough, many of us will say, when I go to work nowadays, I don't do use hand meds. True lah, I also don't use hand meds. Why? It's a requirement. University has to make money out of you. How many credit hours they need? Okay? Once you run a college, you can add any subject you want. Yeah? Renting 101 also can. Clowning 102 also can. Whatever. But you have to do it. Telling me about Bible college, don't do this and do this, is a waste of time. And that's the problem with some people. They make a choice to progress, but their choice often is dictated by their own flesh. And as a church, we want to grow and move forward to the next season. We have to count our choices, look at our choices intentionally. What is God speaking to us? The church leadership has their plans. But what about you who is making part of the team? Are you part of the team? You might say, I don't know why Pastor Panji and Pastor Amner, they want to plan this thing for what? doesn't matter. You're part of the team. Yeah, part of the team. I'm sure you all watch your European you know, football thing and everybody say England should have done this, England should have done this, England should have done this, you know. At the end of the day when the manager leaves, they say, ah yeah, he should have stayed back. You know, that's human being. Yeah, and that's sad because at the end of the day, we, we all get caught up with our flesh. We miss what God wants to say because we are stuck with our choices. And in Lord's story here, while he was in Sodom, Two angels came. We all know the story before God wanted to destroy Sodom. Sent in the angels, met Abraham. Abraham said, look, if there's 45 people, will you save them? If you go, you know, he bargained all the way until 10. And the angels said, fine, if there are 10 people, we will not destroy. But we will go and wreck the whole city first. And those angels came and Lord met them and welcomed them into his home to eat. Now we all know the story. In the, in the night, Men of the town came and said, look, we want these two men that you brought in as guests and to sleep with them. And the Lord says, cannot, 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 cannot. How about I give you my daughters, not married yet? Can I see the scripture? Did I put it up there? Yeah. Lord went outside and said, look, look, don't, don't, don't. I give you my daughters. They are still virgins. They're not slept with any man. You know, I give them for a change. How many daughters here will love your dad to say that? I mean, it sounds good. As a man of prominence, 
my hospitality guest is taken care of, I sacrifice my daughters. But that's basically what the Lord says. I give you my daughters. And the man said, look, we are not into women. We one day is two guys. And before we all know it, let's look at the next scripture. Get out of the way, the angel said. This fellow, get out of the way, the people said. This fellow came here as foreign and now he wants to play the judge. We treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on the Lord and moved forward to break down the doors. But the man inside reached out and pulled Lord back in the house and shut the door. They struck the man, man who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so they could not find the door. The next slide. The two men said to the Lord, do you have anyone else here? Son-in-law, sons, daughters, anyone else in the city? Get them out because we're going to destroy this place for the outcry of the Lord against his people so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Next slide. And so the Lord went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his son-in-laws thought he was joking. Son-in-laws thought he was joking. The first thing I want to stress here Clearly, in this mess up, your life is number one. Nothing changes in your life. Everything is, in Malaysian, say, same, same. Live life like nothing will change. And that's the most scary thing. How many of you have been to camps, prophetic ministry, a prophet comes and gives you the word, your friend will come, bring the handphone to record the word of the Lord for you. Thus say the Lord, the Lord. Oh, if you don't have handphone, somebody last time in the olden days, we take exercise book right now. You know, this is what the Lord says to you. So after the Lord says to you already, then what? And a lot of people say, I will go home and pray first. And so for the whole year they pray until the next prophetic conference so that the prophet will come again and now say the Lord unto you, brother, you have potential. Hallelujah. And you're so excited. Your friend, your cell group leader record for you. Oh, now you keep 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 20, 24. Every word given to you was, brother, you have potential. But you say, hey, what happened? Huh? God, you, every word you gave me was got potential. Yeah, but you never do anything about it. The moment the anniversary service is over, the moment the prophetic conference is over, everything remains the same. Look at the next slide. Look at what happens. Now remember, this is urgency. The angel said, tell your son-in-laws, anybody else you know, that um, we are going to destroy the city and get them out of the city right now. And the next part of it, with the coming of dawn, remember, you cannot sleep, right? People are outside, you can hear voices of those people who are you know, now caught with blindness, they cannot see. It's noises outside that you remember what they do. Those guys wanted to destroy you know, your home. And you went out to tell your son-in-laws and they thought you were lying and thought you were joking. And with the coming of dawn, the angels urged the Lord, hurry, come on, take your wife and your children, get out of here. You see, there's no urgency. There was no, no change in Lord's lifestyle. It's like maybe, oh, oh yes, 5 o'clock, normally I eat my tose. You know, I said, my time for me to drink my masala chai. And the angels look at him and say, hey, what's happening? We told you we're going to destroy this place. People are outside there, lost in their blindness. But you are standing here. You are standing here. Nothing has changed. So let me ask you, has anything changed in your life? Will anything change? You say, yes, we celebrate our anniversary. And so, so what? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to say, God, this year, six years, next year, seven. Great number in the Lord, right? I'm going to climb up into things of God and take hold of that which God says I'm going to do on the seventh year. And when they testify next year, I'm going to be up there and say, yes, God did it. Or are we going to be, like we said, like Lord, same, same. Live life like nothing ever changed. I know many Christians, they go for people to pray 
Every time they pray, they copy down all the prophecies, but nothing ever changed in their lives because they live like nothing will happen. And that's scary. That's scary. You know, I remember a story of a farmer. You know, he was sitting outside of his house, and some people passed by and saw his empty land in front. And they look at the farmer and say, Hey, uncle, your land not growing anything. He said, No, I was thinking of growing, you know, kobis. But then uh, a lot of arnab here, so I decided not to. Lah. Very susah. Then he said, I want to grow jagung. But then uh, got a lot of birds around here. Then I decided I also don't want to grow jagung. Then somebody say, Grow watermelon lah. You know, on the ground. Then he, I said, I wanted it too, you know, because watermelon can make juice, can sell. But then here in this area, a lot of, you know, in Selangor, a lot of this tupai and a lot of rats. Uh. So I didn't grow also. So what did you do, uncle? Well, I decided to play safe. Lah. You don't grow anything, nothing will destroy it. So nothing is growing. And therefore, some Christians are like that. Pastor, if I don't do anything, God cannot blame me. Ma. Devil cannot attack me also because I didn't do anything. He got nothing to gain from me. That's the point. The devil got nothing to gain from you because you are on the devil's side already. Because you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. You are doing something for Him by doing nothing for God. And that's the dangerous thing. So is, are you living your life same, same? Are you playing it safe? Because when you play it safe, you have decided not to grow. You, when you play safe, you decided not to grow. Decided not to grow. I tell my musicians, I say, sometimes... Uh, I very leche to play in church because you know you don't need to practice so much if you already know the songs. Correct, musicians? Yes? Yeah? So if you're singing holy holy, you want to do in G or you want to do A flat A, you know. Don't need to practice. But I say I practice for God, not for you people. So I say if you ask my office staff, they will know that I do the minimum practice of 20 minutes always in the office. That's my part of doing to the Lord. And that's my part of keeping myself sharp. Otherwise, I just close my eye. You know, now I play badminton, I close my eye because I play with kids and small, small kids and ladies. And you know why? Because I bully them. Terrible, right? Confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. <laughs> yeah, because I can't run so much, I play with the ladies, huh? I say, whichever hand you want, you want left hand, right hand also can. Yeah, but, but I don't play to win. Gone were the days where I would jump and say, yeah, go for it. Now, if I play with the, our brother on the drums, I say, hey, you jump. La. I'm not going to jump because I can't. I play it safe. And that's scary. If you allow your Christian life to not grow, what you are practicing is same, same. Life, you live life, nothing like nothing will ever change. And this is the most scary thing. You know, in Malaysia, I tell all my Bible school students, every year for the last 10 years, our statistics, right? Jumlah orang Nasrani or Christian di Malaysia, 9% ke 10%. But one, you see the stats, unless a lot of Christians scared their government record their names as Christian, no, don't want to answer. But generally, 9 to 10%. Okay, maybe some Christians become Muslim in the East, East Malaysia and then some there are new Christians, 9 to 10 percent for the last 10 years. But every year, your church, my church, big church, small church, well, every time say, oh, Christmas, pack, pack, oh, our drama, pack, our stadium, pack, you know, our hall, pack. But in January it comes, Christian in Malaysia, 10 percent. Hey, all this pack, pack one, what happened? Huh? You know why you pack or not? Because we Christians very clever and playing mahjong. You know? We all here, I give some to you, you give some to me. We all like, and once a while we, boom! One salvation. But rest of the time, we, your church can't see my drama, Christmas, Christmas drama, we go see Calvary Christmas drama, everybody pack. Lah. But nothing changed. As long as you are happy, I am happy, that's it. 
And that's scary. Let me ask you, are you bored or not with the things of God? Because if you are bored, it's because the things of this world has dulled your heart to the things of God. And that's why you can sit in church every Sunday, listen to the same thing, come for anniversaries, go for prophetic conference, and leave the same. Never change. Secondly, next, next slide. If you want to mess up your life, take your, you know what's the white thing there? Sugar. Take your sweet time. Take your own sweet time in it. You know? Look at the next slide. He says this, when he hesitated, the man grabs his hand and the hands of his wife and two, two daughters and led them to safety. For the Lord was merciful to them. God was merciful to them. It's like God is looking at them. It's like, oh, Allah, what's wrong with you? I told you, I sent, you know, my angels there to tell you to get out. But you still stand there like Dungu, not moving. And now it's like you hesitate as to whether you want to go or not. It's like you don't really believe. The angels had to grab your hands and grab the hands of your daughter to leave. You are hesitating. You are hesitating. The man who procrastinates in his choosing will at the end of the day have his choice made for him by his circumstances. And that's scary thing. That's scary thing. When you don't act on what you believe, people will say the fool don't even believe it himself. And that's scary. Remember, Lot went to tell his son-in-laws about how God is going to destroy the whole city to get out. They look at their father-in-law and they basically thought he was joking. How many father-in-laws here <laughs> couldn't tell your son-in-laws about something serious about God? And they look at you and say, Daddy, you must be nuts. They don't believe you. Why don't they believe you? Why don't they believe Lord? Have you asked yourself that question? I had a classmate in, in our college time. Every time he walks into the class, you know, as this Chinese fellow, he must open his sentence with four letter words first. I cannot say here, lah, because church. <laughs> okay. He comes in, he says, and then he speaks in English, close the sentence with the same Chinese words again about how bad something is, okay? And every day is the same. Every day is the same. Four letter words opening and closing. And one day the lecturer didn't come in and we were just talking about life. And suddenly went to religion and this guy jumped out and pointed to all of us here. You guys, don't talk anything bad about my God, Jesus Christ. And there was silence. Everybody was stunned. You know why? Because everybody thought he was joking. Joking. Because this guy every day says four letter words without fail in every class from Monday to Friday. And then suddenly comes and tells you, don't talk bad about my God. Nobody believes him. Everybody thought he was joking. We lose our witness when we don't do what we say we do. And don't live out what we say we believe in. The world looks at us and say, Ala ini orang Christian, temberang, tipu. They don't believe us. Don't believe us. When we take our own sweet time to do whatever God tells us, we don't believe God will do it. We don't believe. And when others look at us, and look at us and say, hey, he doesn't believe it. Why do we want to do it? Jesus says this in John 9 verse 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. While night comes, no one can work. This is a scripture I remember when I was a teenager. When night comes, no man can work. Jesus as the eternal God, while he was on earth, understood the urgency of time and the purpose of his mission. While it is day, he must do that work. When night comes, no man can work. When opportunity closes, it is gone. It is gone. You know, the Greeks have a story that says, you know, the statue of opportunity is a man with his hair right in front, but no hair behind. His hairstyle is that, that is, you know, gel in front like this. 
but it is brought up behind. That's the Greek understanding of opportunity, the God called opportune. Because when opportunity runs, you got to grab it. Because when he passes by, who you want to catch, botak la no hair, cannot hold. It is gone. It is gone. And when God brings a moment in your life for you to catch what he wants to do in your life, you don't catch it. You miss it. You miss it. And that's a challenge for us. Why am I talking about this? Because in any anniversary, we believe things will go to the next level of growth, of strengthening, of anointing, of breakthrough. Amen? Amen. And it requires not just the pastor, it requires everyone in the team to step up their game. To step up the game. It's not just the coach. It's all the players. Those who are football kaki, right? It's all the players. Not just the coach. Of course, in football, the referee helps. Uh. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? I know some of you, God has spoken to you, whether it's to take up some responsibility. Your pastor might come to you and say, hey, how about this, opening up your house for, you know, cell group or small group, you know, or doing this thing, or, you know, blessing somebody with this. What are you waiting for? Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 16 says this, See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise men, making the most of time because the days are evil. You know, in the history of mankind, 3,000 over years of recorded history of mankind, only 8% of human history had no war or conflict. Had no war or conflict. In other words, the rest of the time, we were living in days of evil. Right now, are there wars that are fighting? Yes. Are the days evil? The scripture doesn't mean, you know, uh, you know, days of evil cannot do anything. It means even in the days of evil, you live carefully and walk not as fools, making full use of the time. And that's so important. Whether in persecution, non-persecution, war, no war, conflict, no conflict, good or bad, evil or nice in that nation, you redeem time and live it carefully. Live it wisely because it matters. It matters. And that's why Paul says, look, be careful. And Paul used very strong words. Don't be fools. Don't be fools. Don't be fools. You see, let me, let me quickly go. I, I don't have it on the slides. You know, when we take our own sweet time, we could miss out opportunity to, to work out the gifts that God has given us. Yeah? We could rob the opportunity of salvations. That's why the Bible always emphasizes, today, today, today is the day of salvation. Today, today, not tomorrow, today. Today. Because we never know. After we eat our payasam, what will happen? You never know. Yeah? Today, you know, we read newspaper or internet, wow, and a lot of people say, wow, how come people are young and old, or everybody is like dropping dead? Then obviously the answer must be the vaccine. It's just that we have internet and reports more often. Last time, by the time the news come from Timbuktu, very far away. But today is the reality. Procrastination, taking our own, own sweet time, missed the opportunity, the timing of the things that God wants to do in our lives and through our lives. We miss the opportunity of salvation and we miss the opportunity of spiritual growth. If you don't begin today, when will you start growing? When I say just now about potential, 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 when you are 80 years old and someone comes to you and prophesy over you and say, brother, you got potential. Basically, it means you've got potential to go back to Jesus Christ already. You know, when you were starting at 20 years old, the word was potential, 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 30, potential, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, you got potential to go home. Lah. That's about it. You took so long, 60 years. 60 years. What are you waiting for? You say, Pastor, are you telling me to, I'm 70 years old now, I can die? No, no. I'm telling you now, you're 70 years, if you got potential, front the race, keep the faith, finish the good fight, done, get it done with. Yeah? 
the Christian church in Malaysia, especially English speaking churches, maybe not for you all, are all growing older. Yeah? Chinese church is growing faster because a, a lot of youth who are especially Chinese speaking, they're all Chinese speaking. We all banana. You guys must be coconuts, I think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, banana. We don't speak. I speak dialect. I don't speak Mandarin. Yeah. But the English speaking churches are all growing older. English speaking churches tend to tell their children, you go to Australia where you see the white man and you don't come back. Yeah. So we all go there. That's why they have to control Malaysian passport. Also. Yeah. We're all picking fruits, lah. We do whatever it is, but we are there. Yeah, when you go there, you actually see more Asians than Australians. <laughs> That's like that, lah. Yeah, but the thing is that the English-speaking churches are growing older. You know, we need older leaders. Yes, we need. You know, I, I don't know about Pastor Pandian. He's a more experienced man than me, maybe. I always talk to my assistant pastor. I say, one of these days, uh, I'm going to speak to all these 70-year-old guys. Uh, all my sermons don't fit them, lah. Have you thought about that, no? pastors? You know, we always tell you, are going to take that mountain right now. According to Caleb, take it, take it. Hey, pastor, I cannot walk. Also. <laughs> you know, I was telling, say, I have half my sermon must throw away. Right? Throw away, you know. <laughs> I don't know about you. Have you ever thought about that, no, pastors? All oh, our sermons, take that mountain, you know, call down the walls, take down, you know, trash the enemy, bind the devil, all that, right? Then the old man said, I'm a pastor, I just want to walk. <laughs> then I'm thinking, I could have changed my sermon, man. I had to go, go again to Bible school, talk to all these retired pastors. What do they preach to the older ones? <laughs> because it's like, I haven't learned, I haven't come to that point. But one of these days, I will be equally as old. So perhaps we will sit there and sing the older songs, you know, Kumbaya or something like that. But it's like God wants to get us up going. Amen? And the hour has come for us to wake up from slumber, according to Romans 13, because our salvation is nearer now than we first believe. And that is so important. And lastly, let me close. Uh, please forgive me. I have this uh, disease called being long-winded. <laughs> Keep looking back. Jump next one. Yeah, the last verse. The first thing, if you want to have, live a messy life, successful messy life, is to live same, same. Nothing ever changed. Secondly, take your own sweet time. Whatever God say, don't do it all. Thirdly, keep looking back. Keep looking back. And every time uh, we celebrate each anniversary, you will say how good last time was. You know, I have some people who come from other church. And the funny thing you will say, I say, Pastor, you know, last time our church, uh, they used to do all these wonderful thing. you know. You know, uh, and then they like to do this and all that. How come we don't do it here? I was telling if they do all this wonderful thing, why did you come here? Right. You should stay there. Lah. Right. Why come here? And then want me to, what? Copy that. It's like the other church colonized us. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? No? Some people are really funny. Why don't we do like the other church? I say, why? Because we are not the same church. People don't operate the same. They don't think the same. They don't even smell the same. <laughs> yeah? It's okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very funny thing. Let's look at the last scripture. Genesis 19, verse 16 and 17. As soon as they brought him out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop. Anywhere in the plain, flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. And next slide. But Lord's wife looked back and she became a pillar of soul. Don't look back. Don't look back. I think Lord's wife is the only one who's been given the privilege to be named as the one who looked back. Yeah? She looked back. And that's scary. Have you ever looked back? You know, the book of Acts, uh, that we, when we study it, has no ending. It, it, it just goes there and, and it finishes with Paul talking, but there's no end. In fact, you can, you can actually say, hey, Luke, a few years later after you finish, right, when Paul dies, you can come back and then just say, and Paul was be, beheaded and he died, you know, during the desert and closed the whole letter. But Luke didn't do that. He could have ended it. Put a you know, finishing postscript at the end and say, finish it. He didn't do that. He left it open. Why? Because the book of Acts is still being lived out today because it's the work of the Spirit of God through the lives of disciples. 
And today, you know, the Spirit of God will probably record in the book of Acts in heaven how praise Emmanuel Assembly, the English service, gathered here at this time. And they were doing the works of God. They were being challenged not to stay the same and not to waste their time and not to look back. Last time was good, but tomorrow will be better. And the next will be better. You know, we all write our own book of Acts. Have you heard some Christian talking? Their own book of Acts? They are the original X men Yeah. They talk about their X church, X dog, X cat, X boss, you know, X this, X hometown, all the X. Everything about how bad it was last time. Every day also, every time you see them, Pastor, you pray for me. Uh, you know, my ex girlfriend la uh, is like, why? There are better things that God wants to do. But you keep talking about the ex. Those extras are the past. It is finished. And Lord's wife, look back. Do you know that Lord's wife wasn't a bad person? Wasn't a bad person. She wasn't a murderer. She wasn't. She might even be a church member. There's nothing bad about her. Nothing, the Bible doesn't say anything bad about her. She just looked back. The, you know the problem was she had unbelief. She didn't believe enough that God would do what he said would do. That's the difference with the word disbelief. Disbelief, you tell someone and say, hey, you know, brother, you believe in Jesus Christ? I don't believe that. You Christian, you keep quiet. Uh, go back. Uh, don't tell me. Okay, you don't believe. Fine. Unbelief is the word of God told you already, but you don't believe enough to live it true. Live it true. For example, if we were in the desert right now, me and the whole musician team, we were wandering in Dubai in the desert, okay? And suddenly we got lost in a sandstorm. You know, after a few hours, the worship team found me. I was lying there, you know, uh, you know, all my clothes torn because of the wind, like the movie. And I, you know, half dead. Yeah. And Pastor Abner came to me and said, Pastor, are you alive? And I say, yeah, yeah. Barely. Water, water. And Abner turned to, you know, music. Give water, water. I stunny, bring here. Don't have life. Give water, water, give to him. He said, Pastor, drink this water. You drink this water, you will be okay. And suddenly I was inspired. I jump out and say, yes, if I drink this water, I will be saved. <coughs> and all the musicians say, Pastor, drink drink. Then I got excited. I run around. I say, I believe if I drink this water, I will be saved. And all the worship team say, hey, let's do the parts here. Yes, you will be saved. Yeah? And now I got excited. Got backup singers now. <laughs> I'm jumping all around. I say, yes, if I drink this water, I will be saved. And all the musicians say, yes, drink, drink. Yeah? Pastor have no water. Drink. And I drink one more time. I jump out. I believe. Then I fell down. Then Pastor Abner goes, Hey, Pastor died. Now let me ask you this question. Did I believe that if I drink the water, I believe? Did I drink or not? You understand the difference? And there are a lot of Christians who believe. They believe the Bible. Every Christmas they buy a new Bible. I don't know why. I don't know why I buy a new Bible. Maybe they buy a new furniture, the old furniture not balanced, so they put the old Bible to balance the cupboard. Yeah? But I don't know why they buy a new Bible. My wife would say, hey, don't go to the Christian bookstore, please spoil people's business. I don't know why you buy a new Bible for. Why? In fact, actually, handphone now makes it so easy for you, all the translation there. But why do you buy so many Bibles when you don't even read your Bible? You don't believe it enough. And if God prophesied, the word was given to you, you don't do anything about it, you don't believe it enough to walk it through. This, this is a scripture. This is the manifestation of the truth of it, the fruit of the word. In order to reach there, it's called obedience. And if you don't obey God, nothing happens. Nothing happens. You just talk about it. And that's the sad thing. She had a problem with unbelief, and the next one, she had a problem with disobedience. She was not willing to obey. Not willing to obey. 
Let me ask you a question. If God wants to set you free, what is behind? What has in the past that it wants to hold you back so much? What is so good in the past that you cannot let it go? Whether it's your ex-girlfriend. Some people, even if you are married, they still talk about your ex-girlfriend. Why? You're not happy about your present wife? Then why did you marry in the first place? Why? And last thought is a problem with deception. Deception. She was deceived that the things of the world in Sodom was much better than what God could offer. Hence the sad thing itself. Second Peter 2, verse 20 to 22, if you're writing down, it says, if you have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, you are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. A soul that is washed returns to a wallowing in the mud. And that is said, if you really know the things of God, but you turn back again, God says, too bad. Enough is enough. Let me end. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And today we are looking at chosen people, royal priesthood here. A holy nation, God's special people, set aside to declare His excellencies. Each one of you. Whatever giftings you have, whether it is to cook payasam, whether it is to take care of kids, whether it is to make your putumayam, whether it is to make the flowers, whether it is to pastor, whatever it is, you are destined for greatness in the Lord. Success is defined by God, not by what people see. You know, I'm scared that sometimes people come to church to serve is to make their way to the stage. And they're scared. Because we look from man's view that is this level but God looks from the top. Anyone play computer games before? Uh, Real-time strategy game? Never played before? What's this? Pastor Pandian, you've got a very holy group of people here. Hey. <laughs> I play, la, you know, in order to talk to you, I need to play a bit. So I, they cannot lie, you see. But when you play a real-time strategy game, right, you set people there and you put soldiers here and put the soldiers there, you're looking from the top. You see the whole picture. Yeah? But when you are the soldier down there, you will say, Hello, why am I standing here? People fighting there, all I do is walk around. Yeah? You put that person there to jaga that one area. That's all. Until the game finishes already, you're still walking around there. You're wondering why God put you there? It's because God has a reason. Yeah? The game player understands why you need to be there. You can't see it. But the sad thing is some people want to serve. They want to see the only way to get glory is to reach the stage. And they will lie, they cheat, they talk behind the back, back step, you know, reach. And they're scared. Because ultimately when you stand here, you forget that greater is the judgment that God has for you. So if you want to mess up your life, do what I tell you to do. Don't change. Take your own sweet time and talk about the past. But if you want to change, can I have the last it's like, if you want to change, sorry, disappear, never mind. Live a transformed life. Make it count and move on. Yeah? Let me say it one more time. Live a transformed life, everyone say. Two, make it count. Third, move on. Every day I choose to grow. That is so important. If you don't choose to grow, that's why things never change. That's why you take your own time. But if you choose to grow, you want to change. And every moment counts because you're answerable to God. And I believe God wants to do that in each one of your lives. Can I have the keyboardist as we close? Amen. I just want to sing a very old song, a chorus. Yep, very old song. All of you know, you can close your eyes and sing it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Let's honor you. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. 
as we sing it again, how many of you know God is awesome here? You believe God wants to do a mighty thing in this church and through your lives? Just sing it in worship and in your faith. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. No one else but your mighty name, Lord. Because you are awesome in this place, Abba Father. struggling with God has spoken to you and God is challenging you to take a change move on from the past move on from your struggles and take hold even as the church celebrates its anniversary take hold of a new season would you allow God to just speak to you right now the spirit of God to stir within your hearts take a moment with him and say Lord I don't want to be like Lord I want my choices to count I don't want to be same, same. I want to live a transformed life and continue transformed life. Your word says, Lord, you have begun a good work and you will bring it to completion the coming of Christ. Even right now as I sit here, Lord, I know you are doing a work. Let me not throw this moment away. Because Lord, Holy Spirit, I know you're doing a work. Breaking down strongholds, breaking my fears, breaking my doubts, breaking the lives of the enemy, stirring my heart once again for a transformation that you want to bring. Lord, today I'm not going to take time, my own sweet time. I want today to come for you to say it in your word to teach us to number our days so that we have wisdom. And I don't want to look back anymore. The past is the past. It is finished. Tomorrow will be better than today. Even as today is better than yesterday. Hallelujah. Would you just put your hand right now at your heart? Sing along with me if you know. Because you are awesome in this place. In your heart. Mighty God. Let Jesus be king once again. You are awesome in this place. Abba Father You are worthy of all praise To you Lord To you our lives we raise Cause you are awesome in this place Mighty God Sing over your life, sing over your family right now Cause you are awesome in this place 
sing it to Jesus. You are awesome in this place. No. Come, Holy Spirit. You are worthy of all praise. To you alone we praise. You are awesome in this form of sickness in your life wherever you are at just lift up one hand up to the Lord and the other hand put your hands at where you are having that sickness let's just believe the Lord to do a work in our midst if you're having a form of sickness or disease put your hand one hand at where the spot is and lift up that one hand, the other hand up and let's just come before the Lord Spirit of the Lord, your anointing breaks the yoke of the flesh. It breaks the work of darkness. It tears down every work of disease, decay, degeneration in our bodies. Right now, Lord, we pray, Father, for those who are going through a form of illness of any other name, oh Lord, Father, that this disease, decay, degeneration, to bow down before the very name of Jesus Christ. That in the name of Jesus, sickness be bound. Every form of infection to be rendered powerless right now in Jesus' name. Every pain to go. Every form of blockage to be gone in Jesus' name. Every stone to shiver up and go from the body system right now. Every hindrances right now to unclock and unlock. Be open those valves right now in the name of Jesus. Be open every respiratory system that is clocked in the name of Jesus. Right now, we command sugar levels to be ordained and ordered and aligned back to healthy, normal flow right now and function and count in Jesus' name. We speak to hearts to be ordered, to be healed in Jesus' name. Likewise, the lungs to be saturated right now with the oxygen and the life of God. The breathing will be normal without interruption in Jesus' name. And every form of paralysis to unclog right now in Jesus' name. Every arthritis, every rheumatism to be rendered powerless in Jesus' name. Limbs, joints, muscles, nerves, unclock and unblock. Be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak forth your healing right now. That in the name of Jesus, we release healing right now to each one of our bodies right now. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be whole, be restored to health and strength. Be ordered right now, realigned to the Word of God 
created you to be good and well in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Lord of our God. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands as a church. Father, I just want to pray for a sweet anointing, a fresh anointing upon this church as they walk into a new season, the seven year, Lord. Let it be a year of breakthrough. There are many here, O oh Lord, we see a rise of servant leaders to step up into small group leaders, to step up as, O oh Lord, people who would minister, O oh Lord, and be part of a team, a strong team that becomes a voice in the wilderness, O oh Lord, beyond this area, so that they will speak forth of your truth, your gospel, and bring forth many, O oh Lord, into your kingdom for such a time as this, not for the name of a church, but for the name of Jesus Christ and the glory of your kingdom. And so, Father, O oh Lord, we say, not by power, not by might, but by your Spirit. Father, let it come upon oh Lord, this church even right now. And even overflow, Father, O oh Lord, into its outreaches, Father, so that out of where, oh Lord, you have positioned them to be, Lord, your glory, Father, will be made manifest and people will turn to you, Lord. And likewise, in the lives of my brothers and sisters, where you have set them in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their work, in their ministry, in their studies, in their college, wherever you place them wherever they are positioned each day let them be a voice in the wilderness let them be the salt of the earth let them be the light of the world that points the way home for many to you for this nation Father Lord we want to believe that Father sweet anointing, a fresh anointing upon praises, manual assembly in Jesus name we pray